the moment. Our fellow geeks, weebs, nerds, and other unfortunates have been fervently waiting for has finally arrived. It's time for TMI Confessionals of the Nerd Confessionals Kind. Of the nerd Confessionals kind. of the Nerd Kind. And now, your host. Jeff Nerf Herder Chandler and Jim Kaiju Baker. And now, let's get on with the show. Here is TMI. Dun 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 dun. Dun 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 dun. What was that? Dun 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 dun. Did somebody leave their washing machine on? What's. <laughs> That sounds like an unbalanced load to me. It sure does. Which is pretty much, uh, pretty much episode, what our feature everything. film is. That's I go. think that's a very oh, nice way to sum that up. Look at you! Look at you! Right off the bat, uh, for anybody who listened to us last week, we did survive the zombie apocalypse. We did. You know, yes. you know how we did it. We threw Kurt to the <laughs> <We> zombies, <Kurt. laughs> and we took off. What I say, all I have to do is outrun you, baby. Yeah. So, uh, and yeah, as we said, we had complete faith. In the authorities, they've wrapped up this in a nice, pretty little bow, and we're back to normal this week. Yes, until uh, something else happens. Until the next apocalypse. Until yes. that mad cow uh, steps in. So, yeah, what are we talking about this week? Your Terminator. That's what we're talking about. We're talking Terminator. about Terminator. Dark fate. Dark fate. Yes. They've been promoting the heck out of this. For how long have you been seeing trailers for this? Yeah, because I think it was Comic-Con last year that they announced that this was all going down and that Cameron was coming back. Hamilton was coming back. Schwarzenegger was coming back. I, you know, he's 72 years old, dude. 72. She's 63. Is this what we're getting out of our action heroes now? Uh, I hope not. No, Indiana Jones, he's going to be 70. That just, that just makes me face my own mortality. I just yeah. wish these people would stop getting older. And myself Well, at this age, you think his that. catchphrase would just be, ow, my back. <laughs> So, yeah, we'll get into it because we have a little bit of news. How can this heart even breathe all that muscle around it? <laughs> He's got an exoskeleton, dude. I guess he does. Yeah. So, uh, do you want to talk news a little bit? Let's talk news. Okay. Uh, well, we can't go a week without talking about Star Wars. Another uh, Star Wars uh, announcement, which was this uh, D.B. Weiss and Benioff of Game of Thrones fame. We're going to get their own trilogy, and that has now been canceled. Did they quit, or did, was it canceled by Disney? Well, here's the here's the rub, which is, yeah, if you if you look at their uh, their mission statement and their uh, little uh, Twitter f- post that they have now committed to this Netflix series, and they just there's only so many hours in the day, as they put it. But I would not be surprised if Disney is kind of putting a halt. Uh, to any of this new Star Wars development. No, I think what it was was Disney said no to the graphic nudity and to the widespread misogyny. And then they were like, <laughs> we can't do this. Well, I mean, if they if, if the rumors were true and they were going to do more of a, of a, a thousand-year prequel setup of ancient Jedi Knights, who better than these guys who established Game of Thrones with Old World? I mean, I guess it wouldn't have been too big of a stretch. But uh, right. that last, I think that last season of Game of Thrones left a huge uh sour taste in everyone's mouth and maybe they just decided you know what guys we're good See, I i still i still am contentious about that i actually enjoyed that last season the most out of game of thrones yeah i think if i I go back you know what uh, i don't know we we could have a whole episode devoted yeah go back and listen to the game of thrones episode episode 60 episode 60 oh nice look at you pulling that right out of your buttocks uh yes so anyways that has been taken off the table so at this point once rise of skywalker comes and goes we really don't have any new star wars on the horizon nothing else has been announced except for the mandalorian which is set to drop next week when disney plus launches and then this uh obi-wan kenobi tv series no other movies have been announced i think even uh what's his name who was doing well the, the they they did announce kevin feige was doing something but we don't know what that Do is. Do we know when the Obi-Wan show is set to premiere? It's probably, in, it, I, I, no. 
<laughs> I mean, are they done filming it? Is it all set no, to go? No, I don't think just... so. No, I think they just announced the director. Oh, so it's that early but on. But it has, okay. well, I mean, I guess they knew it was going to happen long before the uh, the announcement. Yeah, because I just read something with Ewan McGregor saying that he's been biting his lip forever yes. about yeah. this. Yeah, he's been losing sleep over it. Doctor sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh anyways peyton reed has been uh set all lined up to uh continue directing uh, ant-man 3 we're oh, getting an nice. ant-man 3 very excited for that because you know after watching movies. our classic feature i really would love to have seen what edgar wright would have all over my notes on that one <laughs> yes yeah because he was i mean you watch uh, we'll get into scott pilgrim yeah it is such a unique and original movie and you have to think Here's the guy's resume. This is what we're getting. This is what you're buying into, right? This is why we want this guy because he's thinking outside the box and he's doing something that you've never seen before. Put him on this movie. And then all of a sudden, somewhere along the line. Oh, that's not what we want. Yeah. Yeah. He's not towing the corporate line or the, you know, creative differences. Yeah. I would love to have seen how much of that movie is his and where he wanted to take it. Good or bad, it doesn't matter. You're, you're hiring this artist to to create something in your universe. Just let them do it. And then you've got all these cast members, Paul Rudd included, that came on because largely in part of Edgar Wright. And now he's gone. Yeah. Now what do I do? You know, right. I guess yeah, I got to stay. I signed a contract. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So along those lines, uh, Into the Spider Verse uh, sequel has also been greenlit. Uh, so, I, w- I would have thought that that was a no brainer. That that would have already happened. You would have thought. Well look at what what happened with Sony with the Spider-Man, the live action. So I don't know. Was that, but that kind of is their up? Spidey tent pole. They did that. If I'm not mistaken, without any input from Marvel, I didn't the see Peggy's name into on the that. Spider-verse. Movie. Yeah. I'd have to go back and rewatch it to see, but I'm wondering if it just kind of got mired up in that controversy and they just kind of sat on it until everything was resolved. Mm. Uh, I'm actually very excited. That movie was again, phenomenal that is evidence that sony in some instances has their act together yeah yeah uh the only other so we'll talk a little bit uh about trailers leading into terminator did you see anything about this sam mendez movie 1917 no which so i've seen two things now it's it's this uh world war one kind of action sequence two lead characters one of them is uh, i can't think of it torment from uh, game of thrones and they're sent on this mission to go announce an ambush that could potentially get 1,600 guys killed. So they're, they're on a mission to go and deliver this message. What I didn't realize is that he is doing this in one continuous shot. Like we've, like we've talked about this before where I'm like, if you watch the first five minutes of this movie, it's all one continuous, you know, the camera's following the characters through the tunnel, coming out on the other side, there's no cuts. There was a little behind the scenes featurette that I saw before Terminator Dark Fate. You've literally got a guy with a handheld camera. Now it's got wires and everything else on it. He's running through the trenches, following the main characters. And then all of a sudden he'd release it. And the wires, almost like when you're watching NFL football and you've got the, the, the camera that zooms over the, uh, the field. And so now you've got an aerial view of the characters still in motion and it'll circle around or whatever, and they come back down into another camera operator's hand, and they just continue to follow these characters. I actually, the guy next to me in the theater, because when I started seeing this, they're like, yeah, we're shooting this in one continuous tape. And I said, get the out of here. <laughs> and the guy next to me literally turned around and looked like, like I was talking to the screen, because that is unbelievable. And so you can't just for two hours, like, map out. You can't have... You know what I'm saying? It, it, there has to be cuts. There has but, to be cuts. Otherwise, they would have filmed it in two hours. Done. Correct. The movie's right, done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but after I did some research, and they rehearsed this for months and months. And yes, there will be cuts. To the audience, it'll seem absolutely seamless. And there are scenes where they are following this character, these characters, for 15, 20 minutes without a single cut. And it's all being employed with this handheld camera devices. And like I said, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a mix of these pulleys. I, I want to go see this movie just for this effect. And he says, I don't want you to sit in the theater and be like, you know, you don't, you know, it's like Gemini, man. You, you laud it because of the uh, technical aspects. He says, oh yeah, they I, have to say that. But you know, Sam Mendes is sitting in the back saying, yeah, look what I did. He's looking at, well, he's, he's like, he, even he's, in this he's interview. He's like De Niro in uh, Cape Fear in the movie theater. He's right, like yeah. nudging the guy next to him. Hey, <laughs> hey, 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 look at that. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's impressive, huh? But he, but he did say that there was times when they were planning this out that he was like, this might not be a good idea because the <laughs> cinematographer uh, was like, you're crazy because you, you got to contend with weather. Everyone's got to hit their mark exactly when you need to. And he said that they practiced. They went to boot camp. They practiced for months and months. So whether or not we talk about this movie, I am going on my own time to watch this movie because I am so taken aback by this. I mean, like I said, uh, I think Hitchcock's Rope was like one of the other movies and Birdman. But this is like to a different level. This is where guys are like fighting in a, you know, on the field of battle. You got explosions going off. I got to see it. I I'm, I'm, was blown away to find out that this is how he's, he's, he's shooting this thing. So. Yeah, it's it's not that big of uh, an accomplishment because if you think about it, when we record an episode and it's an hour and, <laughs> and it's an hour and one minute, it plays out in an hour and one minute. We 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 match it down to the line. So yeah, so, we do it every week. We do yeah, this every week. Mendez. <laughs> so there. That, I guess it, well we can just cut that news article out, Don. We don't need to talk about we it. We don't need. Yeah, we don't need to talk about it. That's it. News out. News out. <laughs> We got to get into this other movie. Okay, so did we need another Terminator movie? Were, were either of us excited to see this movie? No, I actually went on record last week as saying that uh, I'm very underwhelmed by this going in, and I said that we were going to see nothing new. We were, there were, we were just going to get the same old, same old. Now, unless Cameron was back on a hundred percent, I don't care if he's got a story credit or what you know, a producer credit or whatever. You always have those sequels throughout history that don't have the full commitment from the original filmmaker and they suffer and they're seen as lesser, you know, lesser stepchildren because of that. I'm well, thinking Jurassic Park movies. 3 is right. the first one that comes to mind. Okay, Spielberg was a little involved, but he wasn't the director. It's he, he gave it to some guy that you've never heard of. And in this case, that's not true because we all know who Tim Miller is. Well, most yes. of us do. But um, still... Cameron just had that kind of background producer story by. So it wasn't really a Cameron movie in the sense that Terminator and T2 was. No, but it was nice to see his name attached to this franchise for the first time since the first two movies. Yeah, uh, along nice, with Hamilton. But, yeah, it would have been nicer if you saw that directed by credit at the end. Yeah, it would have been. It, would be. yeah. and it probably would be a different movie. Because, it would have been. Yeah, just like The Force Awakens, they simply just rehashed the exact same story that we saw in Terminator. Yeah, yeah just, it's, just well, what can genders. you do with a Terminator Well, that's movie, what I'm saying. You know? That's why I said going into this movie, you know, because we've seen, we, we brought it up, Genesis, you see Salvation, uh, Rise of the Machines. So they've, they've mined this ad nauseum. This movie, just like Halloween, we're going to negate, we're going to pretend those other movies didn't exist and this is going to be a direct sequel to Terminator 2, which we can all agree is one of Cameron's strongest movies and probably one of the greatest sequels ever. Yeah. And in 10 years, they'll negate that this movie existed and they'll reboot it again from Terminator 2. Once Cameron realizes, oh, I, I, I'd like to direct another t Terminator movie. Yeah, well, by then, uh, I think that Schwarzenegger is going to be in the ground. But then again, listen, maybe we don't need him because we saw it with Gemini, man, that we could just create our own Yeah, and action. we saw a young Schwarzenegger, a, a very expressive and convincing young Schwarzenegger in this movie. All right, let's get into this because... Okay. So yeah, like, like Jeff said, it, it takes off right from the end of T2 where Sarah Connor has averted the, the, the Skynet ending the world future. It opens uh, with the credit, with, with that video that they made when, when they captured her in the first movie and she's confessing this vision of the future that she saw. I thought that was very powerful that they brought that back in because you kind of forget about that. I mean, she was manic. You know, people were turning into ash. They were blowing apart like paper. I mean, she's screaming. He's like, well, you know, it's a mass hallucination. And she's like, you're an idiot. You're all going to die. And, she, and it was very powerful. It and was. To put this, it and was. to put this at the beginning of the movie, I'm in. I'm like, Okay, we're we're back in this universe now. And like you said, yeah. Now all of a sudden there it is, Sarah Connor and Ed Furlong. Friggin' Ed Furlong as a twelve year old kid <laughs> on the beach and the ninety seven version of Linda Hamilton. They're in Mexico somewhere. And I'm like, how you know, I'm I shouldn't say how do they do this because I know how they do now it. Now we know how they do it, yeah. Right. But it was but it was I'm like, that's friggin' cool. And then like you said, all of a sudden Schwarzenegger shows up and what does he do? They pull an Alien 3. They negate everything that happened in the first two movies by killing John Connor. Spoiler alert, <laughs> they kill John Connor. And not just John Connor, as Jeff said, Eddie Furlong as John Connor. Yeah. 
the same kid that you grew to know and love or hate, depending on your, you know, your uh, view of yeah, Eddie Furlong. But I just, listen, I'm not going to hate on that kid. He was a punk. He played a punk. Well, why kill him if they've averted the Skynet future? Thank you. Thank you very much. So who actually, right. So what's the point? Oh, we'll get into this with our confessional. So if they successfully did away with Skynet at the end of T2, then who the hell sent the beach bum T-800 back to kill John Connor after uh, two years after the fact? Now, there is a throwaway explanation a little later on. Well, I think it's maybe explained in her voiceover, um, if I'm not mistaken, while you're watching this scene play out, that they sent back several, several. T-800s so during just, the time frame of T-2. So he was trapped in the timeline and he was just waiting his time out. Or he was looking for them. And I didn't think it was that hard for a Terminator to find Sarah Connor. Right. So, like, this Terminator has been bumbling around for years trying to find Sarah Connor until he finally figures out that she's on the beach. He was the inept. He was the inept. Uh, yeah. But I guess, okay, I, maybe I missed, I must have missed that, that so, little explanation. So, it's a moot point. By the time this Terminator catches up with them Correct. and kills right. John Connor, they've yeah. already averted the future. Right. But as we learned, just like in The Force Awakens, oh, he did away with the Empire. Well, then someone else is going to step up and take their place. Yeah, it's so like you can't a, avoid it. That's it's, No, you know, correct. It's, it's just yeah. someone else just fills that void. So we don't have a Skynet. We now have what we refer to as Legion. <laughs> but after that opening sequence, it becomes a foreign language film. Now all of a sudden we're, we're, we're in Mexico. Everyone's speaking subtitles. And it's this drama of this girl with her family. In the, I, it was just like, I'm like, what, what is going on here? Like it's a 10 minute sequence of just domestic whatever, all in subtitles. Like, and you know go. what's funny is that there were a lot of people that walked in late to my showing, and <laughs> most of them walked in during this sequence. And I'm like, and I bet like, they think they're in a the... different movie. This... Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> oh, we gotta leave. Uh... So yeah, so this is where we're introduced to the character of Danny, Danny Ramos, who works in a factory in Mexico City with her brother. Yep. So Diego was his name Diego? Uh, I think so. I think so. Played by Natalia Reyes. I Reyes, think the actress's think, yeah. name is. Yep. The story of the movie is following her and her brother at this factory. And lo and behold, also in Mexico City, we get just like in the first one, yep. we get two time travelers arriving from the future. Um, we have Grace, who is played by Mackenzie Davis. Yes. Looking very Robin Wright from Forrest Gump. I kept expecting around oh. the corner. Hey, Jenny. What are you doing <laughs> Jenny, in this movie? Hey, are you a Terminator, Jenny? I got a uh, box of chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> I liked her character, though. Yeah, she was probably one of the better things in this movie yeah. was yeah. Grace. And then we get another bad Terminator. This time called the Rev Nine. Rev Nine, yeah. Uh, who can, you know? He doesn't come driving the Mach Five, but you know, the, Ooh, he that might as well awesome. have been. <laughs> now he is played by the same guy, and I'm, I'm, I don't have his name written down. I know. I, I could only on IMDb. He gets no credit. But he's Ghost Rider from Shields. This is the oh, same get guy. Get out of here! Yeah. His last name is Luna, I believe. And I feel bad that we're now talking about this movie, not giving him credit. No. I'm like, I'm looking in my notes. I don't have his name written down. But yeah, he is Ghost Rider from uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. So, and so anyway, this all takes place in Mexico City. There's a big firefight in the factory. It's revealed that this Rev-9, much like in T-1000. T2, is kind of that liquid metal kind of Terminator. Yeah, he's almost like, he's almost like two Terminators in one brother ends up getting killed at some point so then it's just danny the the, the rev nine impersonates her father and that's how he finds her at the factory yeah so danny's danny's carnage. like what's going on and grace is you know grace is now fulfilling the reese role which is come with me if you want to live yeah grace shows up at the factory and, and of course we've seen enough of these movies we know what's going on she yeah. doesn't i will say the trailer ruins all of the reveals. Yeah, every the first 15 minutes of this movie was very well documented in the trailer. You see, like, every major scene in the first 15 minutes is in the trailer. Yeah, and, and the, the return of Sarah Connor is awesome. And you immediately are like, I mean, I had people cheering in my theater. Like, they didn't know she was coming. Uh, <laughs> She's in this? What? <laughs> yeah, it's fun to see her back. Although that 22 years was pretty rough on her. She Although they did. It. She looks better in the movie than she does in real life. I'm sorry, I, Linda. You know, I'm sorry. I agree with you on that. But, you know, so again, go back to, to Halloween where they, you know, bring back Jamie Lee Curtis and uh, she aged as well. But you have to, yeah, I mean, like I said, she's 63 years they're old. old. Yeah, they're I old. I know. And that's, so up to this point, we kind of sound like we're poo-pooing it, but I did have a hell of a fun time with this. 
Yeah, all those uh, Mexico City scenes are just off the charts action masterpieces. There's some, you know, there's some great yeah. car chases. This is pretty much, I'm surprised we haven't seen a tweet from President Trump saying, <laughs> look at this, I need a wall, come on. <laughs> Look at these Terminators coming over the border. Yeah, because they did sneak in back into the U.S. pretty easily. They did, yeah. <laughs> this is It gets a little derivative of T2 with this uh, Rev-9 and his liquid oh, metal yeah. skin. Like, once again, like I said, they're fun. They're, they're, they're nice sequences, but it's nothing new. It's nothing we haven't seen before. As a matter of fact, there's a couple like moments where, where he's jumping around that are just so on CG character, you know, Venom jumping from building to building kind of thing. And it's like... You know, just stay on the ground. Stay on the ground and have your fisticuffs. Grace, like I said, Grace is a really fun character. She's cool to look at because what you start to realize is that she's got these scars all over her body uh, because she has been enhanced. She is human, but she has enhancements. So she's on the level of this Rev-9. She's able to hold her own. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and that's the only explanation you get of Grace. Like how they enhanced her or what parts of her are enhanced, you don't really know. Right. You just see some, you know, some some cuts to her skin. Yeah, and you she's see like metal a bionic woman. Yeah. Yeah. Or Mecha Godzilla. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, Linda Hamilton steals this movie until Carl comes along. Once Schwarzenegger's back in this movie, he dominates. <laughs> he is the funnest character because it, because he's now playing it completely against type, which I thought was a genius move on their part. So anyways. Uh, well, he's yeah, not so. really. He's still the same Terminator that he was in T2. Yeah, he just doesn't have Edward a purpose. Protecting Edward Furlong. But, 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 the, but the story behind him. So now he has a name, Carl. He, he has a family. He has a company in which he creates drapes. And there's a scene where he's explaining to Danny. And then the guy says to me, uh, you know, I want the white colored... You can't put what you got to put polka dots on there. You're gonna you're gonna ruin the whole room. I and said it's just, no. I said no. No, right. And it just the delivery, and, and and Grace is even like, so your wife doesn't know that you're a Terminator. Like she doesn't r- realize that you weigh four hundred pounds. He's like, we do not have a physical relationship. And I'm yeah. like, <laughs> he's celibate. I, I think I think what Arnold and the filmmakers have hit upon is what women really want. They want <laughs> just they a, want a life partner. A diaper. <laughs> they want a life partner that has no interest in sex and right. agrees with everything they say. Yeah. That's what they yeah. want. Grrr. One of the things, so Linda Hamilton comes in, saves the two of them. And of course, they're immediately like, who are you? And she's like, who the hell are you? So let me get, you know, kind of Sarah Connor's backstory a little bit. You see a little bit more of, of Grace was a, in the army, right? She was a soldier. She was a soldier in the resistance in that, the Legion timeline rather right, than so the Skynet complete, timeline. Right, correct. So she knows nothing about what Skynet is. She's never heard of Sarah Connor. She doesn't know what a Terminator is. To, you know, they call them Rev 9s. It's kind of parsed out towards the beginning of this movie where Sarah Connor shows up in the beginning in Mexico City, takes on Grace and Danny because Grace is in, in, in all sorts of malfunctioning. Uh, yeah, she requires medicine to keep her going and she like shuts down. So that's what they're trying to find a pharmacy to, to get Grace what she needs. And that's when Linda Hamilton's character, Sarah Connor, of course, reveals that the reason that she showed up there on the bridge is that every once in a while she gets a mysterious text giving her coordinates Yep. saying for john and whenever she shows up to those coordinates a terminator comes out of the sky there. and she has yep. to destroy them now again this was not really explained i'm like who are these terminators coming out of the right. sky yeah. and yeah. who are they going to destroy why are right. they even there right you know yeah. we didn't get the terminator looking for danny until unless they are terminators that were looking for danny and then how does carl know that they're coming right because they're now coming from an alternate timeline yeah so, so they would not have the same explained. skynet signatures so yeah, that was, uh, it was, it's an excuse to get them back together. This is really what it comes down to. Cause and then, it, so of course, from that point on, it becomes a bit of a road movie because they're looking for the source of these texts, which ends up being Carl, the same Terminator that killed John Connor in the beginning, and he's getting older. They, they kind of went into this in Terminator 3, which doesn't exist anymore on this timeline. <laughs> right. An explanation for Arnold's appearance that the Terminators get older just as humans do. Right, the skin and, is, it's live skin. So, and they explain that because Arnold has carried out his orders of uh, killing John Connor, he assimilates, and he's programmed to do this, he assimilates into society. So yep. he takes a wife who already has a kid, 
um, he gets a job at a Home Depot, and that's where this whole discussion about right. drapes comes up. And apparently, Arnold, one of his hobbies is interior decorating, so he put oh, that really? in himself. Oh, I didn't yeah. realize that because that is really, like I said, that 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 scene where he's explaining the. Uh, no, no, you can't do that. I don't know if he's named himself Carl or what, but that's this Terminator now has this idyllic existence with a wife yeah. and, and child. And and the child is not his own. He found a woman who already had a child, and he just. He created a new mission for himself, which was to protect these two. Yeah. And just, yeah. And it's comforting that Arnold's performance is as wooden as ever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> rivaling Queen Amidala in episode one, oh. I would have to say. <laughs> yes. So wooden, it's, it's almost as wooden as Jeff would be at an Adrian Barbeau film festival. Mm -hmm. That's how wooden <laughs> <it is. laughs> But I digress. Oh, yeah. Well, we got, we got our uh, obligatory uh, Adrian Barbeau. Adrian Barbeau reference there, yes. There you go. Thank you. We appreciate both of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, you know, there's one action sequence that takes place on a C4 plane. That's pretty cool. But again, yeah, it it's is. not, but it's not like we haven't seen this. The, the, the A-Team movie did the same thing where they dumped a tank out the back, you know, and it's floating down and they're shooting people. The whole reason that they get this plane is because Sarah Connor has a contact at the air base. Yeah, that was a stretch as well. And, no, and he shows up and he's like, I don't commit treason just for anyone, you know. And <laughs> yeah, meanwhile, meanwhile, she's gone on record that she's wanted in 50 states, all 50 states. And she purposely sneaks back into Mexico. This guy at the air base just gives her a plane to fly and away. And immediately gets shot. <laughs> he's like, I'll hold off the soldiers. Don't worry. Take this yeah, plane. Yeah, I believe yeah. you. I'll, yeah. I'll explain it all. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I did like that the Rev-9 did run like Robert Patrick. He did, he did kind of have that, that T-1000 high, high arm swing. But it was too close to the, to, it, the Rev-9 was too close to him. It's like, you know, you're yeah, on I a know. different it, timeline. Correct, and they, right, right, they have the same right. technology you, in that future. Well, that's what I'm saying, which is they destroyed everything in T-2. Yeah. So theoretically, I mean, the Terminator did look a little different. He had no brain head, but yeah, it was the same. Yeah, that's, that was the, the difference here. They kind of did a mashup of the original Terminator yes, and, the, and, the, and the Robert Patrick Terminator and put yeah. them together. So yeah, like I this, said before, there's kind of two different it's almost like the exoskeleton yeah. uh in the gelatinous mold but it doesn't one. seem like that there's a necessity for that because no. the gelatinous terminator does not need the exoskeleton right, it can't exist autonomous autonomously yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it did it was it was kind of cool to look at but again like i said but that you know that was just a reason for Arnold to fight the robot and for Grace to fight the liquid metal yes, thing. It was yeah. like a tag yeah. team match. And that was my favorite. When you get into when you just get down to the, to the nuts and bolts of the of the hand to hand combat stuff, that was fun to me. Again, Miller had to really tone Hamilton down whenever she got to shoot a gun because she would just get a side ish grin on her face because <laughs> she had too much fun shooting all these weapons. And he's like, No, no, you got to be badass. You got to look like you're serious. What were they flying towards? What was the, um, the plan they were going back to, to El defeat Paso. the Rev-9? They were going to El Paso because the army guy had given them an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse, would somehow stop this Rev-9. That was the only thing that was going to take it down. So, and at the same uh, time, you, you're getting little bits and pieces of why Danny is being protected. And you're led to believe that she is the mother of the leader just like Sarah Connor was the leader of the resistance. And that I thought was kind of neat because at one point Sarah Connor could have just gone on her way. And Grace is like, why are you helping us? And she's like, because I was her and it sucks. So she now has a, a, a reason again, I guess, you know, she's been in hiding doing nothing but killing Terminators. Now she has someone to protect. So you kind of got that motherly instinct from her. You know, I couldn't protect my son. You know, I'm going to kind of protect you. The end sequence, the end end sequence begins uh, in the plane and then it ends up at a, like at a dam complex. And there's like a Humvee in the back of the plane. They have to escape the plane, which is going down with the Terminators in it. They have to escape in the Humvee, which has parachutes on it, and they parachute into the water. Now, was the Humvee driving on the bottom of the lake or was it just being carried I think along it was being by the dragged, It was being dragged along by the, uh, the parachute. Uh, oh, once see, it was I underwater see, okay. yeah because it was still on a platform that was a pretty in impressive sequence i, yeah, I don't know yeah, yeah but again all, all i got thinking of is oh it's the car stuck in the tree in jurassic park <laughs> like you know like like there was really That's nothing true. new 
when Terminator, it was hanging off uh, the dam. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. And we, we've already saw uh, Transformers fighting at the dam at one point. Like, like there was nothing new. You just took all these different elements and you just redressed. So, but again, it was fun. It, I enjoyed it. I liked it. I, I checked my brain at the door. Mm-hmm. I, I had a good time. I really liked the character of Grace. Schwarzenegger, for me, stole this. He really was just, it was. I read did, that um, no. his daughter, be, who's married to Chris Pratt. Now, I know. I didn't realize that, that he's friggin' father in law to Star Lord. Yeah. So, I'm but like, they what? were, Chris Pratt and his wife went to see this movie. They probably at the premiere. And he said that his wife, who's Arnold's daughter, had tears in her eyes at the end when, the, when Carl sacrifices himself. Right. Yeah, well, and I, I mean, almost did too. That was a very that, you well. Know, that's just was, it. And, and Sarah Connor, you know, who had a very hard time wrapping her head around the fact that that this is the Terminator that killed John, and she's like, "You do realize that when this is all over, I'm going to kill you." He sacrificed himself one final for John, and he says that was his last line for John. Here's where we get into the conundrum of time travel. So, spoiler alert: if we haven't spoiled a lot of this already <laughs> for you, they give the impression that Danny is the new Sarah in you know 100 percent, like that she's going to give birth to the savior just like sarah did to john connor but no yeah twist is that she's not going to give birth to anybody she is the john connor of the future danny herself and and, and sarah literally says that just to she goes she's john oh thank you we couldn't connect the dots (laughs) she's john so it's funny that you bring up halloween and jamie lee curtis so again this is a strong female like a triumvirate of strong yes. females in this movie, yes. just like yeah. Halloween. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like I said, uh, even before with the, you know, uh, The Force Awakens, you're just taking basically the exact same storyline, but you're putting a female in the lead as opposed to a male. So, but Grace is dead at the end. But kind of like in a throwback where you're looking at your future in the present, Sarah Connor and Danny at the very end go to a playground and see the young Grace there to make sure, I guess they give the impression that they're going to be watching over her. Um, okay, now how the hell did she know where to go to find this Grace? We never learned her last name. Because it's the future Danny that knows everything about Grace, right? It's not the present Danny, unless they are, there was an exposition scene where we weren't, you know, pretty. No, what'd she do? Movie. Go through the yellow pages looking for every kid named Grace? Yeah, I like, don't know. Just, right, that was like, she systematically, yeah. I don't and then know. we assume that, like, that they're going to go off and Sarah's going to train Danny to become correct, the right. badass soldier that she yeah. eventually becomes. Yeah, they even the leave future. in the same Jeep. That she had in yeah. T1. So now here we go. So the movie ends, cut to credits, fade to black. <laughs> so this whole time travel thing, if you think about it too much, it just destroys your brain. Because <laughs> So Skynet in the previous movies and Legion in this movie are sending back Terminators to avoid the future. How do they know they're successful, these, these people in the future? Because right. I would assume you create an alternate timeline when you do that, and well, that's, your if future you're, doesn't change. Correct. If you're buying into the uh, Back to the Future philosophy, which is, right, you can either go back, because in the first movie, Back to the Future, he did change his past or his future by going into the past, but then in subsequent movies, they created alternative timelines. Yeah, so there's no way for the Skynet or Legion to know if they've been successful because they just carry on as... Because it would have never, right, it never would affect them. No. Otherwise, they would just cease to exist. And why do it in the first place? We're going to do it for the alternate Skynet. You know, we, we, right. we got your back, alternate Skynet. For all Skynet. you Skynets yeah. out there, <laughs> we got your back. <laughs> uh, yeah, your brain can hurt because it does get... Uh, even, even with Endgame, you know, we, we had quite the discussion about whether or not Captain America was had created an alternate timeline and then jump right. back into our current timeline. And why not go just... all the way back to like the 1800s and kill her descendants when they have no way to fight you? you know? yeah. <laughs> why go back to where they Mad can Dog actually Tannen. fight you when they have weapons? I don't know. Bonk them on the head. There again, you, you gotta, you can't really think it. it. It's a serviceable, enjoyable action movie. Uh, Nothing more than that. I, I think it's having a really hard time making its money right now. Like it underperformed. I think they were predicting 40 over the weekend and, what did it do? Friday only did 10. Yeah. Mm. Thursday night was, was you know, even lower. Um, yeah, I tend to see these at matinees, and I did for this, so it's really hard to gauge if the, you know, because I had a lot of really people in my theater, but it wasn't one of the bigger theaters in my Regal. We had we have bigger capacity screens, uh, and this was one of the smaller ones. So, And it wasn't like it was playing in five of them. 
So I don't know. I mean, like I said, there was a fair, I had a woman bring in an infant Oh. as I'm sitting there and now I'm sitting in the front row and this lady's carrying in a baby and she's got another kid that's maybe four years old. And I immediately texted my wife and I'm like, this is not going to end well. She did get up once and take with the baby still over her shoulder and take the the young girl, I can only assume to the bathroom. Uh, But that that infant never woke up. Just stay home. How are you going to even pay attention to the movie with an infant in your arms? You know, it's. They they used to do screenings. I know when when my kids were little, you know, they would purposely have a screening in the afternoon where you, you know, you can bring your kids. If there's five screaming kids in there, the moms are like, oh, well, I want to put that kid in the future. Send it back in time. (laughs) So how many buckets are you thinking for this? (sighs) I I usually, my go-to for I was, I was entertained. And I was very entertained. That's that's um, three buckets for me right there. Is yeah, a, is a solid I, three, I, and I'll go no higher and no lower than three. Yeah, I would say three as well. Yes, uh, it was enjoyable. It wasn't anything new. I did like seeing the two of them back on screen together. I don't need to see another one because, of course, you're already starting to read. Well, maybe we'll make a trilogy of these. It's like no, can we just do something original? Like at least, but like I said, these guys are getting so old. Indiana Jones. I keep talking about that. No, stop. Just. Make me something new. And if it doesn't do well, this is pretty much the end. I can't see them rebooting this once again. I think this is... Oh, it'll happen. I'm going to put money down on it right now. I think so? (laughs) Somewhere along the... Yeah. Somebody will will take it, try and do something original with it. It was okay. Go see it. Or wait for it to come out on video. Yeah, if you have time to kill on an afternoon, it is an enjoyable action movie. That's all I got for that. All right. So let's go to the concession (laughs) stand. Yeah get some goodies and come back and talk about something that Jeff has been waiting for I'm for a long time on this. this show. Yes. We'll be back in a sec. Star, enjoy them at your leisure. We have your favorite drink as well. Just ask and we will pour it. And popcorn hot and crisp and fresh. The youngsters all adore it. So visit our refreshment bar. You'll find it mighty handy. We've loads of things so good to eat, all kinds of gum and candy. But don't forget your armor, Frank. For taste and for nutrition, come meet this finest hot dog made. Enjoy this intermission. Okay, here we are back in our seats. Woo! And we are here to talk about Scott Pilgrim. Versus the world. Now, Let's Jeff, this out. is based on a graphic novel series? Yeah, Brian Lee O'Malley. This is his comic, uh, which I never read, by the way. It was kind of an indie underground, a little too quirky, probably. I was, I was entrenched in superhero stuff, so this wasn't really on my radar. But when now, this, this is movie, not an ongoing series, right? It's a finite it, it, it number a, of graphic it was a, novels. It was a series of graphic novels. I mean... Again, I don't know if they you know, were all standalone stories, um, if they tied into each other, if it was more like just sequential sequences, you know what I'm saying? They're just short little, I don't know. But the first time I saw this movie, and even when I watched it again for the show, I, so this is about as close to a five bucket movie that's not a superhero or Star Wars for me. <laughs> it, is, it is, because it is so unique and it is so original, and we just said at the top of the show, Edgar Wright has such a unique vision. And a lot of this does carry through on the comic books, but you, you, we, we've seen, you know, these adaptations where, you know, you take the source material, but then you kind of like strip it of all of its uniqueness. And this just straight up embraces. I mean, it is unlike anything I've ever seen. It's super innovative. Uh, there's not a single scene in this movie that doesn't somehow isn't enhanced by you know, the comic influences or like the musical cues or the gaming references of which probably I only get a quarter of them. The young generation, I think, can glean much more from this than we can. But still, it is, it's a very strange blend of reality and fantasy, but it never yeah. gives you the impression that what the fantasy parts are fantasy for these characters. It's no, reality it is, for it these No, it is reality characters. for them, yeah. I mean, it just starts right out with that universal, the 8-bit universal logo. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, here we go. I don't remember that, but I'm just like, man, they just, they just embraced it. They embraced yeah, from it. From the get-go. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know if I've ever seen this before, this viewing. Really? I always... Mix this up in my memory with uh, that Nick and Nora's mixtape movie, which also oh, stars Michael Cera, gotcha. which is nowhere near this. No, but no. For some reason, yeah, I'm like, hey, this isn't that movie at all. This is no. This is- so and so, 
awesome. it was fun. It was a lot of fun to watch. It is um, a fun It kind of movie. almost, even though it has nothing to do with this plot-wise, it reminded me of Kick-Ass for some reason. It does have that kind of, uh, that I, comic I'm wearing movie, my nerddom, you know. yeah, my nerddom on my sleeve. Uh, yeah. And we brought this, yeah, with Edgar Wright. And it, just, you know, the, the mix of, like I said, the video games and the anime manga. There's word bubbles going on. There's sound effects going on. There's, there's cartoon interludes. If you've never seen this movie and you're into video games, I highly recommend that you check it out just because of its uniqueness. It really does have a, a look and feel all its own. And if you want to see a movie with the originator, Michael Sarah, and not the, uh, the imitator, <laughs> the Jesse Eisenberg. Jesse Eisenberg. <laughs> this and is you know what, prime Michael, Michael Sarah yeah, right here. Michael, Michael Sarah, you know, his uh, no name chin uh, is loud and proud in this movie. You know what's um, funny is that Michael Sarah. I, I was thinking about this during the early phases of this movie. That he reminds me of Beck. You know, famous for a loser and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. And Beck does the music for this. The music. He, all the all the songs that are performed by Sex Bob Om, the um, Michael yep. Sarah's band, are Beck songs. He wrote them. We're Sex Bob Om, one, two, three, four. <laughs> yes. Uh, and every... star studded, star studded. Oh, uh, dude, dude, you know what I figured out? This is crazy, which is we have Captain America, Captain Marvel, and Superman all in this movie. Yes, yes. That's crazy. And this is, of course, you never, you, you didn't, I think Superman, Brandon Routh, was the biggest name when this movie was released. Because yeah, Chris because Evans no... did, hadn't come into his own yet. Brie Larson, no. not. You know, Anna Kendrick, no. All yeah, these Brie people Larson, that you that, don't, you know, I, that became famous after the fact, and all of a sudden this becomes star-studded well, this when was, it wasn't, when it was released. This was 2010, so when did those Fantastic Four movies come out? Well, you knew them from that, yes, right. but that was, was that his was claim about, to fame, was Fantastic yeah. Four, and they weren't right. like huge, huge successes either. No, no. They were like middling successes. He plays completely against type anyways, uh, yeah. to a large degree. So the reason we paired this up with uh, Terminator, because it doesn't, on the surface, it doesn't look like there's any correlation whatsoever. But Tim Miller was creative director of Blur Studios at the time, and they did all the visual effects in this movie. Um, so this is, this is uh, his pedigree is kind of all over this on the production end of it before he became a director. Our tenuous connection is there yeah, by listen, revealed. That's enough, it's enough to get me to watch it and, and to talk yep. about it. So that's all. <laughs> Sometimes so you so the, the plot of this is pretty simplistic. It is very simplistic. Yes. It's Scott Pilgrim and he's the bass player in this uh, little Toronto band called Sex Bob Om. Is how do they, Sex Bob Om? Is that how yeah, they? Yeah, you got to kind of Bob Om. Anybody that doesn't know it just says Sex Bomb, but that's not actually yes, the, correct. the name of the band. Yeah. Uh, so he's dating. He's trying to um, rebound from a failed relationship with yeah, and he's a loser played to begin by, with. He's really a bit of a loser. Yeah, and he gets he gets more than a lot more than Jesse Eisenberg. Also, a little bit unbelievable here. <laughs> yes, correct. With the quality of woman that he's he's yes, getting correct. here. So he goes out with Brie Larson, who dumps him. But now Brie Larson is a famous singer. So he's trying to rebound with a high schooler by the name of Knives Chow. Knives so Chow. Everybody browbeats him for this because it's like he's dating a child. He's 22 and I think she's Yeah, 17. the dialogue in this is off the charts. There's so many throwaway lines that are just gold. Just little golden nuggets that, that it gets better with uh, repeat and they're, viewings. Yeah, they're making fun of him for dating this girl. And he's like, oh, we almost held hands, but she got too embarrassed. And <laughs> Right. Yeah, exactly. If you're going all the way, have you had sex? Yeah. <laughs> Knives Chow. Uh, Ellen Wong played her. I, I, I don't know if she went on to do anything else. But she is great. I loved Knives. She's yes. great. Great character. Yeah. Full, of, full of energy. And but then he meets Ramona. He has a dream about Ramona, Ramona. who is played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead, who we just had on the show on uh, Gemini Man. Yep, yep. You know, she yeah. had a great time talking to us at TMI. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I love her. She loves me. Yeah, go listen awesome. to Gemini Man for our interview with um. <laughs> Yeah, so, nice. so yeah, she plays Ramona, and you know, only you Pixies slash Frank Black fans would realize this. But during the party scene, where um, Scott's character actually speaks with Ramona for the first time, they're playing the song "I Heard Ramona Sing" in the background. There, but that's but that's the brilliance of this movie. There's so much going on that on the surface you're just kind of seeing, but yeah, you start digging down, and, and the musical cues and the references and and the. Uh, there was one scene toward the end where Jason Schwartzman is the, grabs the ring on his finger and they play the little sound effect from Flash Gordon, Ming the Merciless. Like it's a two second little <laughs> And you're just like a genius. Yes. So Ramona is high maintenance to say the least. 
she has a league of seven ex evil boyfriends. Is that what they call it? <laughs> they call it the, the, the league of, of, of evil exes because yeah. they're not all boyfriends. Yeah, but you don't realize this at first. He he's like head over heels with her, and he wants he wants to know every because she's new in town. So now there's the scenes where he's running through this party asking everybody, "What do you know about Ramona?" And um, Aubrey Plaza plays his band member's girlfriend on again off uh, named Julie, and she's like, "Do not mess with her." You leave her alone <laughs> and you find out, yeah, that she has all this baggage with her and he wants to date her. And next thing you know, he starts getting emails. That's the one thing with this movie too, which is it's like slam bam, very comic booky. Everything, like you said, it, it, it morphs into fantasy sequences that you're just like, now, now they're like floating through a door and you're like, what the hell is going on? You, like you just go with it. And my favorite favorite character is his roommate played by um karen culkin wallace and the running joke is that wallace is gay and every time uh scott comes home he has not only a different guy in bed but they keep multiplying so and he's they only have one bed so he's got to sleep in he's the same sharing bed. he's sharing a bed with him and then Andrew kendricks plays scott's sister the little, little sister is she supposed to be 16 is that what nah, I said I, at some yeah point? that was a stretch but, yeah it was uh, a stretch so uh we didn't mention kim who was the the drummer uh, Allison. The caustic red haired drummer. Yes. Yeah. I don't think she ever blinks. No, like very you... Pippi Longstocking S. Yes. Like, yes. Yeah. yeah. The freckles, the whole bit. Yeah. Um, and you find out that, that Scott dated her at one point in seventh grade. And dumped her. He dumps yeah. a lot of girls, apparently. Yeah. So you find out pretty quickly that, that he's a player. But again, <laughs> Ramona is just as bad because she has these seven evil exes. And throughout the movie, Scott has to defeat each and every one of them in order to win Ramona's hand. And this is, and this is where it goes straight up video game one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. There's a scene where he's in the video arcade with knives and it's almost dance, dance revolution, but it's, but it's a, but fight. It's a fight game. It's, a, it's fight a fight game. game. And they are so in sequence with each other and they're jumping over and, it, and it's a really cool, fun thing. But then all of a sudden, like he's fighting like that in real life. And, and it's just, again, you either go like, what the hell am I watching here? Or, or you, you just go just, along with it. Yeah. You, you just, just go with it. it. So, so and the great thing is that every time he defeats one of these guys, they turn into coins. And each one gets he gets more and more coins. Yeah, and then the first time like he defeats the first guy and he's like, "Oh, sweet coins." So the first guy is Matthew Patel and he's Indian, right? And he's they're battling down and all of a sudden he launches into like this Bollywood dance. He's like, "You dated this guy?" And she's like, "7th grade." <laughs> but apparently Every time somebody dates her, they got to fight the previous No, no, the, the, the league was set up it uh, was by, it, um, by Gideon. Gideon, so Gideon he, he was the one that wanted to, yeah. to get back with her. And I guess, I, I don't know, he wanted to tire out Scott by making him go through the whole, I don't know what his what Yeah, his but we didn't, we didn't meet him was. until later on. So, yeah, so, and I just, you know, the band members are like, you know what, Scott, you finish this up, we're going to be down at the cafe. And there's you know, a lot of alliteration going on here with these evil exes. Gideon Graves, Lucas yes. Lee. Yeah. Roxy Richter, you know, it's, yeah. it's very comic yeah. booky. There was a really fun scene uh, where he can, he gets uh, Ramona to come over to the house and he's going to have a date with her. So he's trying to get Wallace out of the house. And he's like, I don't want you gaying up the place. <laughs> but when he comes in the door, they're playing the Seinfeld, that little sound effect. <laughs> and it plays like a sitcom for about a minute and a half. Because yeah, every there's time somebody enter, there's a laugh track and everybody right. applauds when he enters yep. the apartment. It yeah, was like, great. Just yeah. so just out of left field. This now stuff. can we talk about Chris Evans' appearance here? Yes, in, uh, because because he <laughs> Lucas Lee. There you go with your alliteration. Now if, you know this is again one of Ramona's ex boyfriends, that, and he happens to be a movie star, an yes. action movie star. Just happens to be in town filming a movie. And there's no way that Scott can beat him one on one in a fight. So what he ends up doing is tricking him into doing a terminal skateboard yeah, it was like a grinder trip. down a railing. It was like, it was like this. It's it, like a mile long railing correct. down a flight yeah, of stairs. Because he's got all of his stunt, his stunt members are all dressed and look exactly like him. And they were doing a beat down on uh, Scott. And yet somehow Scott magically defeats he gets all up them. And he dares him to do this trick in front of everybody assembled. So I, I guess, you know, Lucas Lee has no choice but to do the trick. Right. Yeah. And of course, kills himself at the bottom yep, of the railing. Explodes, yep. And he gets 2,000 <laughs> points for Lucas yep. Lee. I love the fact that as he's screaming down the railing, that the speed was in kilometers because, you know, they're in Canada. <laughs> just little stuff like that tickles me to no end. And I love there's one scene when Michael Sarah or Scott Pilgrim has a SARS t-shirt on, which if you remember, SARS was that 
quote unquote deadly disease yes, that was coming yes. down from Canada to kill us all, but yeah, then disappeared and, after that one winter. Yeah, and even and that's another thing too, which is these little Easter eggs of these shirts that he wears. He cons- and even like Ramona, Ramona's hair like changes colors two or three times throughout the movie. And right? my wife also pointed out the uh, the Canadian broadcasting symbol that uh, oh really that Scott no, wears that. on one of his t-shirts. Oh, okay, yeah. gotcha. So so yeah, all these little things that are just it's just another layer. Of, of these of these you know of the you detail either, you, that they're that's that yeah um, you either see it or you don't you appreciate it at its level but once you start digging down like i said even like the musical cues and some of the stuff that's playing in the background like i didn't know that you know the song you pointed out before and at one point he's having a conversation and i think it was with wallace and he goes did you say the l word he goes lesbian he goes no the <laughs> other l word he goes lesbians <laughs> And then knives he needs he needs to break up with knives because he really wants to date to, well at this point he cheated on her he's he's already been with ramona but uh, he technically as they point out he also cheated on ramona with knives even yeah. though technically depends no, on your definition of cheat but yeah no because he was um, seeing both of them at the same time but there's a scene where right she comes knocking on the door at the apartment and wallace opens it and she goes ah, is scott here and he goes no and you just see scott dive through the window behind him <laughs> such a silly little thing uh and then we get fight number three for about like a 1.0 he's walking home and all of a sudden this girl attacks him and he immediately punches her she says you punch me in the boob i'll be back and then disappears and you're like what the hell was that which one was was brandon routh number four yeah it was fight four yeah now i loved his character he was like he had super vague in powers this was my favorite fight scene in so each one of these people that he's fighting have different fight techniques so like, like I said, the first one was like a Bollywood Indian kind of flair, whatever. Lucas Lee was a, a much more street fighter type of thing. And then you get Brandon Routh, who was very Superman-ish with his glowing eyes and, and eye vision. And he was punching him in the air and he'd fly up. He's, this, is the, this is the ex-boyfriend who apparently punched a hole in the moon. And every time you saw the moon in the background, it does have a hole in it. <laughs> <laughs> so little stuff like that. So also, um, he is the current boyfriend of Scott's ex, Brie Larson, and he's is, the bass player in her band. Yeah, uh, NV Adams. And at one point, they go to see the band, and they get invited backstage. And uh, oh, meanwhile, uh, so Knives now realizes that something's going on with with Scott, uh, and she dyes her hair to look more like Ramona. And this guy punches her. He punches her, and he. <laughs> They go to pick her up. He goes, you punched the highlights right out of her hair. You <laughs> cocky cock. You pay for your crimes against humanity. <laughs> but he does get his ass kicked. And then he realizes the only way he's going to win against this guy is to have a base battle. A base off. Yes. A base off. So then it's like, dun, 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 dun. it's like the dialogue in this. If I pee my pants, can you just pretend I got wet? Yeah. <laughs> like just stupid little. Did you notice the four and a half shirt that he wore at one point? That was, uh, I think what Franklin wore. In oh the Fantastic yeah. In Fantastic Four. Four. So yeah, they have this base, but he tricks him because he's a vegan. He's a straight up vegan. He doesn't touch any meat or whatever. And, he and that's him. where he gets his power from. Yes. Yeah. So he, apparently he tricks him into drinking a latte that's got milk in it. And the vegan police immediately show up and strip him of his powers. You once were a vegan. Now you will be gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And I felt like I, I knew those two guys, the vegan police. But One I of didn't... them was the original Punisher, Thomas Jane. Oh, is that what that was? Okay, yeah. so I didn't, I didn't look it up. I, it was kind of like when I was watching it, I said I should know these guys. But I didn't uh, do my research. So we had the Punisher, Captain Marvel and Captain America, there along with go. Superman Holy in this sh- movie. Sh- superheroes keep piling up and then that girl roxy comes back for uh fight three 2.0 that i think was my favorite fight scene because the, she ends up fighting just because she Ramona. had that whip that, that whip thing that yes, i think yeah. she was she was really good she was very kind of um well she had a hood so to me it was it was very spider gwen ish yes looking, yes you know before spider gwen was probably even a thing yeah and of course he's like wait a minute you dated she goes i was bi curious well i'm bi furious <laughs> 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 just kick her in the balls he screams <laughs> so yeah he defeats her as well well he he doesn't want to punch her he doesn't want to fight a girl so ramona is ramona using steps him in, yeah his, but she's using him like a rock'em sock'em robot and she's right. using her hands to punch his hands but then she decides that you know what you're just another evil ex waiting to happen that you don't but then we get five and six who are really throwaway opponents. yes correct the yeah, twins the, the, the dj how twins did, how did, 
Katayanagi twins and that was a fun fight because that's a band versus band amp right. versus amp so you know they're they're creating like these dragons out of the sound that are attacking the band and then they create like this this giant gorilla looking thing it was fun it was different and then we get the ultimate x who was played by jason schwartzman yeah schwartzman two emos fighting each other man that is but he plays it cool i like this character i mean he's a douche yeah, and he play, he's he's very good at playing a douche. You know? yeah, yeah, so much so it's like maybe he's that way. In right, life. <laughs> typecasting is that what you're implying? <laughs> the band gets a contract with Gideon Grace because he is a music mogul. I he's guess. trying to buy him off. Yeah, to, yeah, to get him yeah. to stop dating Ramona by giving yeah. him a record deal. So he quits the band because he wants nothing to do with it. And he go, and Ramona is now at his side. You know, so he kind goes of in. like Princess Leia sitting by Jabba. Yeah, the Hutt. basically, yeah, he's yeah. literally like petting the back of her head. And Scott goes in there immediately, gets his ass kicked, and dies. He gets killed. And as he's laying there in the desert, he's like, uh, I feel like I learned something, which sucks because I'm dead. And then someone realizes that um, he, he had earned an extra up. life. He, he had an extra life, life. In, in earlier the in the movie. So you get the repeat of the entire five minutes that you just saw before he comes in, beats up everybody, uh, and then has this unbelievable knockdown drag out uh, sword fight with Gideon. So pretty much what that is, is it's like a video game where if you have an extra life, you start the level again. You, you right. get another shot at it. Yep. Yep. So he goes through the same motions or whatever, but he changes it up and he makes his way to uh, Gideon and uh, they have this great beat down. And then, then two girls knives gets involved. Ramona gets involved. Now, then uh, you find out that Ramona's got a chip in the back of her head. And that's why he, he's good. Gideon has implanted that chip so she would be devoted to him and then uh, yeah. they get it removed. I, I, at one point, uh, Gideon did uh, refer to Knives as uh, Kung Pao Chicken because she's Asian. <laughs> Some throwaway racism. We got it all in this yeah, movie. That's, yeah, you got it. The power of love. You know, and then he pulls a sword out of his chest and then he realizes that he has the power of self-worth. And that's, that's how he defeats him. Now, the interesting thing here is that the original ending had Scott and Knives together. Oh, okay. But that was before, I guess, the last uh, installment of this series of graphic novels came out in which O'Malley brought Ramona and Scott back together. So the ending was changed to kind of to, go to along with, with that the, final with the, novel. Huh. So rather than go with Knives, he ends up back with Ramona, which is with a very Ramona. pretty and pink-esque thing to do, where the hero or, or the lead character doesn't go with who you think they should he go should with, go but with, with the yeah. bad choice. Just yeah. like John Cryer got put by the sidelines at the end of Pretty and Pink, so yeah. did Knives. Because I like Knives a little better than Ramona. I yes, think. correct. Ramona was a little aloof. She was a little full of herself. Yeah, and Knives, um, you could tell, had more feelings towards Scott than Ramona ever showed throughout yes, this whole movie. Yeah, she was so, very uh, You could tell, what, you know, maybe two months, maybe two weeks after the ending of this movie, she dumps him for somebody else. <laughs> I'm guaranteed. <laughs> It is, like I said, it is a near perfect movie for me. It is just so much fun. It was fun to watch. It was, it was an experience. I'll tell you that. It is yes. a cinematic yeah. experience, really, that's unlike anything else that you're going to yeah. see. Yeah. So, so, you know, you talk about the Terminator, which we're not seeing anything new. You're seeing characters you've seen, but this is, this is straight up unique and original and unlike anything. I'm surprised that it never went anywhere else, you know, because I guess there's no other stories to draw from. Maybe that's why. I don't know. But it I kind mean, of fell by the wayside in pop culture. It's like a little gem waiting to be discovered. Yeah, well, we're hoping that we uncovered it. I would like someone to... So what would you say? You're going to go pretty high. I'm I got to go buckets. four and three quarters. I, I mean, jeez. Would I even go five? I probably, I mean, there's really nothing bad I can say about this movie. Would you equate it with a Stand By Me, a Winter Soldier, anything else that we've inducted already in the five bucket? They're different movies. It's a different... Would you feel the same way about it that you would Stand By Stand, Me or something Stand else? Stand By Me, or I, Goonies, a lot of or, them. you know, anything else. Aliens. Is it on that level for I you? think it would be. I think it is. So are we I inducting this right now? I, well, I, I would put it up there. Yeah, are we doing I'm the fanfare? To, do it. All right. We're going to do the... That, Jeff is for me, up in his I am, ante. I am putting this five leg, buckets. I, Yeah, just in talking alone. It, All right. So in that case, I, I, I'm not even worthy of giving this my own buckets. I am going to go along with Jeff. As per the rules of TMI, <laughs> I will also go the along charter. with it. 
five five buckets. We're Charter inducting State, this man. into the TMI five bucket list. This is this is a this is one of those movies that I turned on to my kids probably way too early, especially when you get into the the Wallace situation. More, I mean, there's really nothing racy about it at all. No, it's a PG thirteen, right? So yeah, as a matter of fact, not Julie got a lot of profanity in. No, it, no, it? the one character Julie uh, Aubrey Plaza, whenever she curses, she uh, censors it herself. There's a black that bleeps with a black box over. And Scott at one point says, "How do you do that?" <laughs> So it is, yeah. We didn't even bring up Nega Scott that he defeats, you know, he, he defeats uh, uh, Gideon. And all of a sudden, yeah, but can you defeat yourself? And then Nega Scott shows up and it just cuts to the two girls waiting outside. And he walks out. Then they're, you know, the two nerds are, all right, I'll see you next week. All right, yeah, he's a really nice guy. Yeah, we're going to have brunch next week. So <laughs> <laughs> even negative Scott is just Scott. It was fun. It was fun yes, to watch. Yes, I'm glad. Share it with your friends, so kids. There you go. So, okay. Yes. So that brings us to our confessional. Confessionals. And we kind of already talked yeah, about this we've in our review of road, Terminator, yeah. but we wanted to bring up just time travel in movies in general. Can you do time travel in a movie with it making sense, with it standing up to discussion, to argument, to even thinking about it? Is, is it even worth it? To, is it? Or is it lazy writing to fix everything with a time travel subplot? I don't know if it's lazy writing. I mean, I think there's a lot of thought that goes into this. I mean, you know, Avengers Endgame, to go back into those movies is genius. It is, but but it doesn't, but does it hold up when you think about all these alternate realities and Cap no, living no. out his life in no, one because we don't and, know and how showing really up in this other out. reality? No. I mean, like I said, I brought up Back to the Future too, which is top of my list as one of the greatest movies ever made. The first movie, he changed, he straight up changes his present he changes the course of his life his parents life because of what he did in the back so uh, yeah in 55 yeah. when we talked about this in the five bucket episode for back to the future when marty comes back at the end of the movie his family has changed but what happened to that marty in that yes, reality? exactly what what did happen to that marty and i think mike was arguing that no it would have been instantaneous but no you still have all your memories you know, even to the point where, you know, the Twin Twin Pine Malls is now referred to as the, the Lone Pine Malls because he ran over one of the trees. He fundamentally changed the past, but you're right. There had to have been a Marty that grew up in that world and knew his parents, not as losers. So what happens to him? Where did he go? I mean, yeah, does he, di like Mike's argument is he disappears the minute that the other Marty comes into that reality. Right. And that they're just home without him and he shows up. And that that's the Marty that they've always known. Yeah. But I don't I, buy it. I don't, I don't buy, buy it either. It. No, no. And in, in, the, in the subsequent Back to the Futures, it's alternate timelines because Biff has gone back in time and he's created an alternate 1955. So the timelines skew from there. Terminator, the, the, the first Terminator stands alone. They changed. Right. But even that Reese one, did, like, let's right, pick up that argument again. How do they she, know that they're successful? How does Skynet right. know that they're successful yeah. in sending back um, But even, Arnold? But even Sarah brings up the fact that, you know, did Reese know that he was, you know, John's father? And if so, did it change, you know, like, if he didn't come back in time, John wouldn't have been born. Right. And what's so to stop is, Skynet from just sending Terminator after Terminator to different timelines if the one is not successful? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Looper. Do you ever see Looper? Yes. Now, that's another one, but again, it's it's an old Bruce Willis, older Bruce Willis, who's a hitman for people in time jumps. I'm trying to remember the, 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 the gist of this story, but basically he was forced to kill himself. Like his future version was set back to kill him. That one falls apart because it's it's like, what? Wait, wait. But if you kill yourself, then you cease to exist. And it's exactly what happens at the end of the movie. But what about the time machine? What about the H.G. Wells time machine? He doesn't really change anything. He's just a, he's just in the time machine itself watching history unfold. He doesn't really affect anything, right? He's just, he's not a guy who went back and accidentally stepped on a butterfly and destroyed the world. Right. Or you can look at time after time. With, uh, I know, I wanted to bring Wells that one up. And which Jack is, the Ripper. Yes. And all he is, succeeds in doing is taking Jack the Ripper out of his timeline. That's a movie we need to talk about because that was on HBO ad nauseum back in the... Right. As what, was 79? that one, What was the movie with Christopher Reeve and uh, Jane Seymour? The end, he Hunt. leaves the penny from the future in her yes. pocket and she yeah. picks it out and then her mind unravels or whatever. And how about Star Trek Four? They saved the whales in Star Trek Four. You are right. And that's actually a good one because that it is doesn't... probably the best, my favorite Star Trek movie is Star Trek Four. Oh, absolutely. 
Well, maybe yeah. not. So not, not as good as Star Trek II Wrath of Khan, but it's up. There. But you're right. They go back in time. They rescue two whales that were going to, they, they had no effect on the past or present to bring them back to the future to avert this. Uh... Like time after time, I think the best time travel movies are like those fish out of water where that great yeah. scene when H.G. Wells goes into McDonald's and he just imitates the guy in front of him ordering yep. I like a Big Mac, some fries, you know, even talking <laughs> like him. I'm going to bring up, I brought this up once before, but I'm going to bring this up again. It's something I stumbled across on Netflix. It came out in 2009 and it's a British movie. It's referred, it's called Frequently Asked uh, Questions About Time Travel. It's like a British sitcom. It's just a bunch of guys in a pub who are confronted with this lady from, she claims to be the future. Uh, but they find that the bathroom door is a portal and it's just, it's, it's, it's time travel like done wrong because they, no matter what they do, they just continue to screw things up. And every time they come out of the bathroom, it's another, you know, Armageddon or it's a zombie apocalypse. It's, it's brilliant. It's so well, it's, it's like Shaun of the dead. What with time travel? It's just got that weird British sensibility about it highly recommended just as a time travel movie to answer the question which is no time travel is um it's a trope yeah it never makes uh, sense it never holds it, up you can't no, question no. it too much you, hot tub time machine How about that's that the way one? to do it you can't yes. take it seriously no right correct the only thing they were missing in that bill was and the ted. kid bill and ted bill right? and ted's excellent adventure probably one of the better time travel movies that's actually, you, that's a good one right there. Yeah. That's a brilliant. And they're making a new one now. Know. Do we need it? Do we need it? No. Did we need this? Did no. we need Terminator? <laughs> All right. So should we talk about next week? We should. We are going to cover Dr. Sleep. I, Jeff is I... entering into that uncomfortable territory again. This looks really good though. This looks good. I've seen the trailer a couple of times now. Um, I do. I have seen The Shining. My sister actually worked in SD State Park where that uh, hotel is. Really? Where they filmed it, yes. When she, when she came out of high school and uh, she was working out there in Colorado for uh, a year or so. So I'm wondering, and I'm going to have to look this up to see if the filmmakers are really going off the movie or if they're going off the novel because there are key differences between the I movie and the novel. I read something which was uh, the fact that they brought up people are more familiar with the movie than they are with the book. So I think they're, it's, it's more of a sequel, direct sequel from the, uh, the movie. The movie, okay. The movie. So we didn't want to be uh, Captain Obvious, as we normally are here at TMI. So we did not <laughs> officially pair Dr. Sleep up with, the, with Shining, the Shining, but we thought, hey, let's, you know, let's visit another Ewan McGregor movie. He's yeah, got that's a not million episode of them. one, two, or three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we thought maybe we'll go back to his roots. The first time you really became aware of Mr. McGregor in a film. And that was Danny Boyle's, famous from uh, 28 Days Later, Danny Boyle's Shallow Grave. Also now, starring I'm, Christopher Eccleston, one oh, of our Doctor Who's. Doctor Who. Yeah. Now, I'm not familiar with this movie. I had to look it up because I did not, when you brought it up, I, I'd never even heard of this. Ewan McGregor definitely leaves an impression. You know this guy is going okay. places when you see this movie. Oh, oh Ernie and... Boyle. So yes. thanks. Thanks, everybody, for yes. listening. Yes, we have some pretty big news, personal news, that we can't really divulge quite yet. Keep listening, kids, because uh, we are going places. We're going places. More places Here. for you to listen to us. Yes. Woo! This is big. This is, this is very exciting. But, uh, so hopefully next week we'll be able to reveal what this is. I would is. like to think that we could as long as we sign all the contracts. and uh, you know. <laughs> Oh, and the... let me also point out that anybody listening in the Dutchess County, Ulster County area, we now have a full-blown movie size ad at the New Paltz Cinemas in New Paltz. So if you are local to this Ulster County area, please go to the movies in New Paltz Cinema. Go 20 minutes early and check us out. We're running before the movie starts. And so we're on the big screen, baby. We're on the big screen. So, so let's follow that up, which is if you are in the theater and you see our ad, take a picture, share it on our Facebook or Instagram page, hashtag movie nerd. And maybe we'll give you a prize. I always have to figure out what it is. Let's see yeah. if anybody responds to that. Yeah, let's see. That's yeah. pretty local advertising. But uh, you know what? We're trying. We're, We're trying, trying to get out there. Yeah. Or if, you know, even drop us a line, our email, tmipodcast2018 at gmail.com if you've seen it or you want to make a request or if you want to just voice anything else. So yeah, yeah. Uh, tmipodcast2018 at gmail.com. Cool. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you, wow. Jim, as always. Thank you, Jim. All right. We're out. Thank you.
What? 